ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's, can you hear properly? Because this is a very long room, as you may have noticed. Uh, and I don't think that the sound projects out. I think that you have to use this in order to hear. Uh, is that correct? Are you okay if you're listening to this? It's all right? Okay. I apologize for this you know, distance between us. The objective of the meeting is to reduce the distance between us rather than to accentuate it. Uh, and I would like to thank you very much for having come this afternoon and made the effort to come. Uh, and I think, if, if I may, I will uh, start by introducing my colleagues, but uh, also say a few words about the past year, about some of the priorities for the future, uh, and uh, some of the issues that, that we see looming on the uh, intellectual property horizon. And of course, it'll be rather selective. It's not going to be uh, covering, it's not going to be exhaustive in any, by any means, uh, because I think what would be more interesting is to engage in a dialogue afterwards uh, and to be interactive. So seated here on my left is Christian Wisher, who's the Deputy Director General for our global issues uh, sector. Uh, and on my right is uh, Sherif Sadala, who's the executive director in charge of uh, our Department of External Relations. And seated on my far uh, left is uh, Anna Morovitz Mansfield, who is the head of our NGO and industry section. And I would, who's responsible for the organization of this meeting. And I would encourage you all to reach out to Anna uh, uh, because uh, her appointment actually was meant to be a signal that we are more and more serious about wanting to engage with you uh, in the non-governmental sector. Uh, so any ideas that you have on ways in which we can do that better, then please uh, feel free to uh, talk to us about it. So um, let me start then with the results for last year. And I think, look, First of all, one of the things that we notice is that the demand for intellectual property titles consistently continues to consistently uh, outperform the world economy. So if you look at the growth rates in the world economy across the last 15 years in particular, you see that the level of increase uh, in the world economy is consistently lower than the level of increase in demand for intellectual property titles that we see, which is a natural expression of uh, the increased investment in knowledge-based capital and the uh, increased uh, basis of wealth being, uh, or the basis of wealth being increasingly uh, knowledge-based capital or intellectual capital. So in uh, terms of our systems, our international systems. In the PCT, we saw that uh, it grew by 5.1% last year. The first time we passed 200,000 international patent applications, 205,000 international patent applications. Interestingly, 80% of the growth came from two countries, China and the United States of America. So China, with about 15% growth, uh, moved into third position in terms of the number of international patent applications filed. Uh, so it now goes the United States of America, Japan, China, and fourth position, uh, Germany. So China surpassed Germany uh, <coughs> last year for the very first time. And the United States of America, uh, it grew applications, international patent applications grew by 10%, which is really large number, a large amount over a very high volume of about 26% of all applications. In our uh, trademark system, Madrid system, uh, growth was 6.4%, which was very good. So that's moving up, and I think that growth rate reflects also the geographical expansion of the system. 91 uh, participating countries at the moment, uh, and we expect that number to grow significantly in the coming years. And then uh, last, our Hague system for industrial designs uh, grew by 14.8%, which is a large figure 
but it's on a very low volume at this stage. It's on a volume of about 3,000 uh, international applications. Uh, and I think we will see uh, that the Hague system will just be completely transformed in the course of the next two years, as a matter of fact. Uh, because uh, within the next week or two, the Republic of Korea will join the Hague system for designs. Uh, later this year, the United States of America, China, uh, uh, Japan, and the Russian Federation are all expected to join. So this is going to be a completely different uh, system. And I think that this reflects also uh, an increased a heightened awareness of the value of design as a part of innovation. Uh, so let's take the uh, iPhone as an example, and the iPhone added about $30 uh, billion to the value of Apple Corporation, and only about 25 to 30% of the innovation was patents. Uh, the rest were designs and branding and marketing. Uh, so I think there is a, a heightened awareness uh, of design as an essential element of the creative economy, uh, and that is one of the reasons why we are seeing increased interest in the design system. Uh, in terms of our um, normative agenda, then if I may move to that, well, the ex outstanding result last year was the Marrakesh Treaty, and I'd like to extend a thank, uh, uh, our thanks to many of you who were involved in uh, the uh, development of the Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, we have done various uh, uh, analyses or thinking about you know, why some treaties are successful and some other normative exercises are less successful. And I think one of the reasons, there are probably several reasons for that, but one of the reasons is uh, the engagement and alignment of civil society. I think. So uh, if you look at the Beijing Treaty, I think that you had a, a, an important engagement uh, and alignment on the part of both the studios and the actors. Uh, and that was important, as well as, you know, I summarize, as well as all the other uh, parties that are interested in audiovisual performances. And I think if you look at Marrakesh, we ended up with an alignment between the uh, World Blind Union uh, and the visually impaired communities uh, on the one hand and eventually the publishing uh, communities and the rights holders on the other hand. So uh, I think your, you know, your engagement in these exercises is an essential element of the success of the exercises going, uh, going forward. Uh, so the Marrakesh Treaty, I think, was an outstanding result. Um, I've said before, but I'll repeat it again, that normally the measure of success multilaterally is that everyone is equally unhappy uh, uh, with the result. Uh, but this, in the case of Marrakesh, I think was truly an instance in which it, everyone was equally happy with the result. So it was an outstanding result, I think, which managed to, on the one hand, respect the international uh, copyright system and its architecture, and on the other hand, deal with the specific needs of an identifiable and meritorious community, namely the visually impaired uh, uh, the persons who are blind, visually impaired, or print disabled. So uh, thank you for all of your involvement in that. Going forward with our normative agenda, let me say uh, that, uh, as you're aware, there are probably four exercises on that may come to maturity in the course of the next two years, in the course of this year and next year. So this, this in our terms, biennium of 2014-15. Uh, and I will cite them without any particular, uh, not in any particular order of priority, but just um, as they present themselves uh, in a rough chronological order, it may be. But first of all, there is uh, designs again, a proposed design law treaty, which would be a treaty really of business simplification. It's a essentially procedural treaty uh, and simplifying the procedures. When, when you look at what designers have to confront if they want to obtain protection uh, across several jurisdictions, 
for designs, which should be a rather simple matter, because you know, for uh, in large part there is no substantive examination of the application. Uh, usually, there's no substantive a a a examination of the application. They confront a bewildering array of complexity in procedures, and there's no good reason for that complexity. You know, if there was a good reason for the complexity, then it can uh, exist, of course. But there's no really good reason. So the exercise is really finding best practices for a simplified form of, of protecting uh, designs, applying for design protection. We're very, very close on it, extremely close. Our committee met uh, two weeks ago, I think, or last week? Last, last week, week, last week. Uh, our committee met last week, and um, uh, I think many of you are aware that the outstanding issue uh, is that certain countries, uh, mainly certain developing countries, uh, do not want to agree to the convening of a diplomatic conference to conclude the treaty unless there is an article in the treaty, it is agreed that there is an article in the treaty, to provide technical assistance for compliance with the treaty. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the United States and Canada are taking the position now, I express it in its latest formulation, that <clears throat> they accept the possibility of an article in the treaty, but they do not accept uh, that an article in the treaty uh, is a condition of convening the diplomatic conference. So we're really down to fine distinctions, and you can see that this does not concern a substantive issue. Uh, and the substantive text is you know, in very, very good shape for adoption. There's not many issues outstanding. <clears throat> we hope that by our May uh, Extraordinary General Assembly, it's May 7 and 8, I think, um, we will uh, get a positive decision to convene the diplomatic conference later this year. And we think that that would be a very good thing because first, we don't want too many issues falling into 2015 or it becomes unmanageable and there are too many connections made between not necessarily connected subject matters, uh, first of all. Uh, and secondly, it would continue, I think, the process of con confidence building that we have seen amongst the member states with Beijing and then Marrakesh. So we think it's very important uh, that the treaty does get concluded this year. Um, then I think we have, uh, of course, the exercise of broadcasting, and I know a number of you uh, wanted uh, to talk about uh, broadcasting. Well, I think we can say, and uh, Michelle Woods is here, and also Carol Correra, who are both very much involved with this, and Carol has been for many years. Uh, and I think uh, in the case of broadcasting, we had a very good meeting in December, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done if the assemblies are going to decide in September this year to convene a diplomatic conference for 2015, which is the objective uh, that they have set for themselves. So uh, we are uh, not pessimistic. We are cautiously, I'd say, cautiously optimistic, but there is a lot of work to be done, and we would just underline that. It looks like, and of course this is for the member states to decide, uh, and the negotiation is underway, but it looks like the member states are edging towards a treaty which would have a fair, fairly narrow scope. Uh, it would deal principally with the prohibition of the unauthorised reproduction of the broadcast signal on any media. Now. That's not agreed position, so please let me underline that. Uh, it's not accepted that that provision should be in there, and it's not accepted that the treaty should be limited to that. You know, there are different, there's a, a, a penumbra of views as usual about what the scope should be. But there is a sort of a little bit of an edging towards this sort of an approach. Uh, some would like it to be broader, more property rights to be included. You know, uh, others uh, ha are a little hesitant about reproduction on all forms of media. So we need to, 
I think, more experience with this and to see where it goes. But um, it's, I think the atmosphere is positive. Uh, then we have the IGC, which is uh, underway at the moment, as you, uh, many of you know, uh, in a two-week meeting. It's the second meeting of three that are scheduled for this year. And look, frankly, uh, this is a, a terribly difficult and challenging area. It's our 27th meeting, you know, and it is the 14th <laughs> year of discussions. So this is um, really a marathon. Um, and I have expressed the view before that I think it's the area of greatest political risk for the organisation. You know, uh, we, uh, the demandeurs are impatient. Uh, they have been waiting a long while. Uh, and we have to find a way of uh, being able to deliver on this particular project. I'm happy to talk more about it, but uh, let me say that it's not easy uh, at all. And Christian uh, is the first to know about this since it falls into his sector in his uh, been sitting through the meeting this week uh, in particular. So that's really a major challenge for the organisation. Um, and then I'd say uh, the fourth area that I'd signal is our Lisbon Agreement for the uh, International Registration and Protection of Appellations of Origin, Appellations of Origin, a species of geographical indication. There are 28 member states uh, involved here who have decided that they want to revise the Lisbon Agreement. Uh, and they've decided uh, at the moment the draft envisages that the new uh, uh, Lisbon Agreement, the revision, would provide for an international register of that would cover both appellations of origin and geographical indications. Uh, if you would like to know the difference between appellation and origin, and a, um, and a geographical indication, I suggest you consult the oracle at Delphi. You know, it's a matter which is fine distinction legally, uh, but the inclusion of geographical indications in an international register is perceived as being a huge step forward uh, because this has been under discussion uh, internationally in one form or another for a long, long time. Um, and uh, it is an opportunity to establish a truly international register dealing with this uh, area, which I th would emphasize is of growing importance, like most areas of intellectual property, is of growing importance, I think, because um, in an age of globalization and standardization, uh, I think that uh, diversity has a greater value and people look for the specificity of products uh, which is linked to geographical origin. Uh, and um, I think we could also say that in, a, in an uh, age of global value chains, authenticity also has a greater value. Uh, and for both of these reasons, we find geographical indications being more and more, I'd say, valuable. Um, so that's our normative uh, agenda. Um, going forward, I'm going to stop talking in a moment, but I, w I did want to mention uh, perhaps three uh, areas um, uh, which are not specifically program related, but I think areas of, of great uh, interest to the organization. Uh, or to intellectual property. Uh, one is a fairly abstract point, but I would say that one of the biggest challenges for, I, I want to move to the most general level of intellectual property, and I would say that one of the biggest challenges for intellectual property in the future will be getting the right balance between uh, collaboration and competition. Uh, so I think that there is a big tension between these two things. So what we see actually is a bigger emphasis on each of those things, I think. So we see in the first place a bigger emphasis on cooperation. You see that in, uh, in um, open innovation, which envisages innovation 
structures and global knowledge networks that are connected. You see it, I think, in global value chains. You can't have a global value chain unless there's cooperation amongst a number of different actors, and the basis of the cooperation is usually information and technology. Uh, so uh, you see, I think, uh, many, you see the sharing economy uh, again, uh, much emphasis on the sharing economy in certain sectors. So you see this great emphasis on cooperation on the one hand, and a lot of developments related to that. On the other hand, uh, we see that in the knowledge economy, you know, uh, competitive advantage is conferred by innovation and intellectual property and knowledge and information. Uh, so a greater emphasis on intellectual property as the basis of competition. Uh, and I think this tension between cooperation on the one hand and uh, uh, competition on the other hand is one of the issues that is going to be, you know, under consideration in intellectual property in, in the future. Uh, and actually, if you were to read an article by uh, Samuel Parmisana, who was the president and CEO of IBM, uh, called The Globally Integrated Enterprise, uh, that was published about three years ago, four years ago in, in Foreign Affairs, you see that uh, he talks a little bit about this and says that for this reason, uh, intellectual property will be one of the major geopolitical issues of the 21st century, finding this balance between, you know, uh, information technology being the means of collaboration, but also the means of co competition. Uh, so now I move off the very general, if I may, uh, and say uh, that in two other areas I'd like to mention very briefly. Um, one is the digital economy. So uh, I uh, would like to, very much like to see uh, or to encourage the member states engage in a dialogue about uh, the digital environment and intellectual property. Of course that's happening, of course that's happening, and it's been happening internationally also since the early 90s in the sense when, when the internet treaties of 1996 were, were first envisaged. Uh, so in a certain sense that's happening, but of course uh, in another sense, uh, there are many, many developments occurring uh, in this space uh, which are both an opportunity for uh, intellectual property and a threat to intellectual property. Uh, and I think we need to uh, pay close attention to this space uh, and I'm very keen in seeing a dialogue develop uh, on uh, the global, legal, global, digital marketplace uh, and how we get to such a, a, a result. And I don't think that this is a normative exercise. I'm not proposing a normative exercise here at all. It may be that there are certain normative tweaks that need attention in the uh, copyright system and digital environment, for example, the first sale doctrine uh, or, you know, which, or the John Travolta, if you like, the John Travolta problem of buying 50,000 tunes on iTunes, songs on iTunes, and then wanting to know whether he can uh, give them to his children, bequeath them to his children. Because if he bought 50,000 CDs, he could, you know. Uh, but you can't, actually. Uh, so that's, the, you know, there may be certain areas that require tweaking. But uh, I think we're talking really about the machinery of the marketplace and how it operates, data standards and so on. And I uh, am interested in trying to encourage a dialogue on, on this. And the last area I would say is um, the, uh, in the development uh, capacity building area, uh, the area of appropriate technology. So I think over the last couple of years, we have been able to put in place a number of the tools which facilitate at least the passive transfer of technology or the transfer of passive technology. Our program for uh, technology and innovation support centres, for example, our program with the publishers, the scientific medical uh, and technical and medical publishers, where they make available scientific journals free of charge to LDCs, anyone's in LDs in a least developed country and at a very moderate uh, cost to low income. Uh, middle-income developing countries. 
so those tools, I think, are very useful. But what, what I have heard, in certainly in some of my visits to least developed countries, is that it's one thing uh, having the source of technology in a written form, and it's another thing knowing how to actually do this. Uh, and so uh, I think the area of appropriate technology is one that we can look at profitably in the future. Um, but of course we always, always must be aware that we are not, we are an agency which is concerned with you know, intellectual property. So we would be likely to be doing some of this in collaboration with others who would be more practical uh, agencies, uh, I think. But I think it's an area that we need to, to pay attention to. Now there are many things that I have not mentioned for example, our ac now newly uh, named, if I'm allowed to name it, Accessible Books Consortium, uh, which is the former, uh, the artist formerly known as the Stakeholders Platform, uh, or WIPO Global Research, or many of these things where we have very active cooperation with, with uh, NGO sector. Uh, but perhaps they can come out in, in the course of our dialogue and I should stop talking and be very happy to hand the floor to you. So please uh, take advantage of it. We have two ladies, yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, um, Alexandra Patacharya from the Third World Network. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a general question about the implementation of the development agenda. Uh, what is your assessment in the past few years in terms of how far it's been implemented and mainstreamed into WIPO activities? Um, I know the CDIP is discussing an independent review of the development agenda, so I just wanted to get your feeling about this process. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, naturally, I'm going to have a rosy view of this matter. Uh, and, uh, and I do, because look, I think that uh, if you go back to 2008, <coughs> what the de development agenda was in May of 2008, uh, 46 recommendations were adopted. And that was the development agenda. So what we've done over the succeeding six years is look at practical ways to implement those 46 recommendations. And <clears throat> those practical ways consist, first of all, in the 23, I think, projects that we have uh, formulated and executed and had evaluated, uh, and three or so that are continuing projects in various forms. Uh, and they, that has been to a value of about 26 million Swiss francs. So I think those projects have by and large been very successful. Now the development agenda is not just about projects as you know and everyone is aware, but we have two treaties, two multilateral treaties that mention the development agenda, which is the very first time that that has ever occurred. So both the Beijing Treaty and the Marrakesh Treaty mention, acknowledge the development agenda in their preambles. Uh, and that area of uh, seeing the development agenda reflected in our normative program is not a secretariat mission. It's not something that we are capable of doing. It's something that the member states uh, have to decide amongst themselves how to give expression to it in the normative agenda. Uh, and then mainstreaming, well, uh, I think we've made a lot of progress in this respect. Uh, uh, the, the process with the projects has been to make them part of the regular program and budget. Uh, we uh, have a situation in which we hope that our development dimension and our development uh, uh, perspective is not compartmentalised into one sector, but is something that is considered across the organisation in all of the activities that the Secretariat is involved in. So in all of our activities and programmes, we seek to consider the development agenda, a uh, development uh, dimension of the activities and programmes concerned. So, uh, I think that we've come a long way, actually, 
uh, and uh, I uh, said earlier that I think that the area of greatest political risk for us as an organisation is the IGC process. If you had asked me that question six years ago, I would have said the development agenda. And I don't think it is such a area of political risk now because I think we have made good progress on it. Everything's not, nothing's perfect, you know. So, please. Uh, if you would like to give several questions, then it's better that you all speak. Sure, if it's working, okay. <laughs> My name is Erika Duenas, and I work for the Medicines Patent Pool. And uh, I, I would like to thank you for the invitation to this uh, meeting. And uh, my question is mm, related to um, public health and uh, intellectual property. If you have some plans or projects to share with us here, thank you. Thank you very much. We don't have any. Uh, look, I think what's happening is, first of all, our WIPO research, uh, with which you are familiar, or shall I say something about you're f familiar with it? Yes, indeed. Uh, so that uh, we're very keen on, you know, um, improving the participation in it, improving the collaborations that are concluded under it, and improving the hosting agreements that, are, that are, uh, take place under it. So we think, think it's an important mechanism for you know, accelerating the sharing of research and intellectual property in these areas, as well as uh, building capacity. So that's uh, one program that, that uh, uh, we are keen on seeing develop further. Uh, as you know, in our Standing Committee of Patents, there is one of the items uh, under discussion, or proposed to be under discussion, is patents and health. Uh, I don't think that uh, I'm unaware of any normative agenda uh, associated with that, as opposed to, at this stage, at any rate, a discussion about it. Uh, and then uh, I think that our uh, role is uh, trying to provide uh, supportive technical uh, explanatory explanations where possible. Uh, to other instances where the issue of the intersection of health and intellectual property may arise. Uh, and finally, we are uh, involved in an active cooperation with the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization, under which we hold um, a, a, a seminar together uh, with the three directors general of those organizations uh, being involved uh, and under which we have published a publication, as you know, on uh, access to medical technologies and intellectual property uh, and innovation. Uh, so that's the scope of our activities at the moment uh, and we're not seeing, I think, anything outside of that coming from the member states. Yeah. Uh, Thiru, I think, was here. Thank you, uh, Director General. I had Three questions to raise, but I think for the sake of time, I'll just stick to two. Uh, one of them deals with uh, technical assistance, which has already come up. So would you see that the technical assistance that WIPO is currently providing in the areas of patents and industrial property, uh, do you see that as consistent with the WTO Doha Declaration mandate of um, using TRIPS flexibilities to provide access to medicines for all. And secondly, um, in terms of both technical assistance and in terms of balance, on, on, in terms of um, technical assistance, does WIPO have a policy in terms of conflicts of interest and in terms of um, you know, seminars, conferences, and panels, does WIPO have a policy on balance? So uh, for example, on the issue of patents and health, we were uh, recently made aware of a meeting uh, jointly convened by Greece and WIPO on innovation and access to medicines. And uh, what concerned us was that when we looked at the program, there wasn't really any participation or room for public interest voices on the program. Thanks. Uh, yes, so thank you. So uh, on the first one, well, it, look, as you know, technical assistance in terms of uh, legislative or policy advice is demand-driven. Uh, 
So it has to come first from the uh, member states, the request, uh, and it's also guided by the policy orientations that they wish to adopt. But of course, without fail, we uh, illustrate, we, we um, uh, demonstrate the full range of policy options that are available to member states in accordance with the existing international uh, regimes for intellectual property, including the TRIPS and the Doha Declaration. So this is something that is a matter of standard practice uh, for us. Um, and then it's up to the uh, member states to make their policy choices uh, on that basis. Um, uh, conflicts of interest, we have various, uh, well, we have, as you know, a chief ethic, ethics officer, and we have various policies on conflicts of interest. Uh, I don't know whether uh, we have considered it also from the angle of, of um, uh, participants as lecturers or presenters at, at, um, uh, at conferences and meetings. Uh, I think we need to think about that further because we may have no one at the meeting, you know, uh, because I don't see who isn't interested. Uh, in one way, either as a producer or a consumer. Uh, in, in, so we need to, I think, ref think about that. You can think of an acute example in the area of um, medicines, but is an actor interested party in uh, a, a legal framework for the protection of, of copyright? Uh, you know, so I think this is something we'd need to reflect on a little bit to to have a firm position on. Mm. Please, gentlemen here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roth Malpani. I'm uh, with Medicines on Frontiers Access Campaign. I'm the policy director. Um, I'll start with a couple questions, although perhaps eventually some of my colleagues will have some also. Um, it was good to bring up WIPO research, uh, which is welcome in one sense in that it is looking at the problems of innovation and the fact that our the current patent system does not meet many of the needs of uh, people living in developing countries. Um, but we have been fairly concerned that it doesn't really meet the needs uh, that exist today with respect to medical innovation. Um, and it is not a true pooling mechanism as much as it is, is just sort of a, a database of existing, let's say, opportunities without any real structure to push forward with collaborations. So I think it's welcome from our standpoint if there's a real serious rethink around how to make WIPO research work so that it more accurately meets the needs of medical innovation today. But my question in particular uh, with WIPO research is our concern with the geographic scope of the agreements, which is that it only requires uh, 49 least developed countries to be included in the access provisions, which from our perspective is inadequate when you look at the uh, disease burden today increasingly in developing countries, which sits increasingly outside of least developed countries. So leaving out in particular middle income countries where a vast majority of people suffering from neglected diseases and even diseases like TB is increasing, and also where the vast majority of people living in poverty are living today, means that WIPO research is really excluding the vast majority of people affected by these diseases. Um, as a separate question, maybe to follow up, so it just would be to get your feedback or reflection on what we consider to be a problem with WIPO research. Uh, a second question we would have is more specifically around technical assistance going to developing countries. One of our concerns has been the repeated use of um, these seminars to push the idea of pushing for anti-counterfeiting measures, which in our opinion is a subset of a much larger problem around the quality of medicines, which actually should focus upon the quality of medicines and quality assurance measures. And we are concerned that these workshops often are overemphasizing anti-counterfeiting measures and are sacrificing the need to focus on public health interventions to ensure that patients have access to quality assured products. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Well, look, uh, on the first point, uh, we're always happy to engage in, you know, dialogue and would, would be happy to engage in dialogue with you about the uh, shape and direction of BVMH. I would say um, two comments, if I may. You can only build with what you've got, you know, with the materials that are available. You, you, so what we are trying to do is to engage different parties in doing what they are prepared to do. Uh, so, um, you know, we might have a, a different participation if we, 
if we change the nature of the thing. So we've got to do what is practical and what is possible, I think, first of all. Secondly, you know, I would just restate what you've said about the uh, middle-income countries, just to make it clear so that everyone understands. <coughs> uh, the sharing is free. So it doesn't matter whether you're a least developed country or a middle-income country, you are able to acquire subject to it being available, the uh, intellectual property uh, or the unpublished scientific data for the purposes of research free of charge. There's no license fee there. The license fee attaches to sale. Uh, if you develop a product uh, on that basis and you sell it, then that's when the license fee kicks in. So that, that's to put it in, in context. Uh, and. Uh, in that respect, the, there is a licence fee for the uh, sale of products for middle-income countries. So, um, then on the technical assistance and the quality assurance, well, you know, we would of course agree with you that this is a, a larger problem of quality assurance as the, you know, unrememberable acronym of the WHO working group, you know, um, tells us. Uh, however, um, we are only an intellectual property agency. You know, we can't stray into fields of quality assurance. Now, let's put it in context with other collaborators, other partners, fine. We're quite prepared to do that. But we have to stick to our remit. Uh, and, and that remit is not, you know, does not uh, cover quality assurance mechanisms, uh, other quality insurance mechanisms that the WHO res has responsibility for. But we would be happy to see if we can make that more apparent that this is part of our larger problem rather than the only problem in the area. Yeah. Benoit? Mm -hmm. And please, and after, yeah, uh, Thank you, Mr. Director Guri. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Yes. Okay. I'm representing Health and Environment Program. So we are African NGO. And uh, my question is uh, concerning uh, how can you, uh, in this uh, research, uh, protect the rights of those who are part uh, practice uh, traditional medicines? Thank you. <clears throat> well, it's under discussion at the moment in the Intergovernmental Committee. That's, that's a major part of the discussion. And as you know, we have texts on the table for this, uh, and those texts um, have been discussed for a long while. Uh, and what we're looking for really at this stage is a breakthrough. You know, we're looking for a way to express, I think, the need uh, uh, to express the, the, the gaps in the intellectual property system with respect to traditional knowledge. Uh, so I think one uh, such gap is the uh, original empirical observation of cause and effect, often with respect to genetic resources. And there are many examples of that. So if you look at the Houdia plant, you know, the original observation, empirical observation, if you eat that plant, it has an effect of appetite suppression. Or the original empirical observation that that variety of wild rice uh, was not subject to blight when all cultivated varieties of wild rice were subject to blight. I think that's what's not being captured in the intellectual property system at the moment. Someone who comes afterwards, a scientist, and will locate the active ingredient, or the active molecule which is responsible for that effect, is covered. But the original empirical observation is not. And I think we're not capturing that sufficiently in the texts at the moment. So uh, there is a big discussion about this, of course. Uh, and um, there's no easy answer, I'm afraid. But uh, it's a high priority for uh, the organization. Benoit. Boy. Thank you, Director General. Um, you talked about the uh, landmark successes of the Marrakesh and the uh, Beijing, or I should say in the other order, the Beijing and the Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, and my question is, uh, what is WIPO planning in the current biennium 
uh, to promote their uh, ratification and faithful implementation? And would you be able to guess when uh, either of two, these two instruments are likely to enter into force? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Benoit. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. There's no point in having a new treaty unless it is serving the purpose. So we are looking to those member states who express the demand for the treaty to help us by ratifying the treaty. You know, it's one thing to say you absolutely must have this treaty, you absolutely must have it, and then they promptly don't ratify it. So we are looking to put a little bit of pressure back on the member states who were demandeurs for either of those treaties to actually come forward. Now, I think lots of things that said, lots of things are happening around the world. So we had a meeting last year in the month of December, if I'm not mistaken, where we had uh, at the ministerial le level for um, uh, West African countries, and that covered both um, Beijing and Marrakesh. And we got, I think, extremely good commitments from all of the countries of 14 countries uh, represented, 16, 16 countries represented of uh, their intentions to proceed to ratify both of those treaties. Uh, I think we run into the problem around the world always of priorities, that there are lots of uh, priorities on legislative time and, and we have to get slot our way into uh, that uh, those legislative agendas. Uh, I believe that in the United States there are active preparations for the rep uh, for you know the process of ratification of both of, of the treaties, although there's a long way to go. So I think there are many signs that we see. We also see it in terms of the number of countries that ask for authentic copies of the treaties, uh, because that's what they need to put before their parliaments, and that's a, a good indicator that they're actually uh, seriously in the process. Uh, ha hazarding a guess is, well, as they say, you know, the, um, it's very dangerous to make predictions, especially about the future. You know, um, so <laughs> I'd say a couple of years we need. Mm. Please, and please. My name is Enrico Natale. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the International Federation of Library Association. I want to thank you for um, the meeting and this opportunity to meet you and uh, state that uh, IFLA is uh, committed to the ongoing discussion inside the NCCR on uh, the matter of copyright exceptions and limitations for libraries and archives. We're looking forward um, to the next uh, 27th session of the CCR, and we are actually working with our members to uh, source relevant information for the discussion, especially on the fact that libraries are central actors of uh, the knowledge economy, but also that they do not operate anymore uh, in a national framework. And in this context, we are a little bit concerned by the fact that uh, equal time uh, would be dedicated to the discussion on uh, exception and limitation for library and archives, uh, in regard also to the discussion of on the uh, broadcasting treaty. So um, we would welcome the, the idea of an intercession specially dedicated to the, to the limitation and, the, and the li exception for library. And I wanted to ask you, how, wh what guarantees can you maybe provide to the fact that uh, equal time would be dedicated to both objects? Yeah, why don't we, yes, collect a few more questions and then I'll come uh, back, if I may, and um, come to the libraries. Okay, please, gentlemen here. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, I'm from the Centre for Internet and Society, an organisation from India. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this question should be addressed to you or to the Secretary at large. One of the things we were concerned about is uh, the possibility for increasing remote participation. Uh, seeing that uh, we're from a developing country, our budget doesn't really allow us to attend as many meetings as possible. So if there's some mechanism for us to not only follow the meetings online, uh, but also to possibly participate in, in the meetings, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, please, the uh, lady here, then the lady on the right, the lady at the end and the lady on the right. And then Okay, thank you. My name is, yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Director. So my name is Yuan Chu. I'm from Medicine Sans Frontiers. Um, I just have a follow-up comments and small questions regarding the 
um, topic of public health, because regarding um, the uh, the feedback you just gave in, in in terms of technical assistance, I wanted to uh, follow uh, for your opinion um, in the context of development ag uh, agenda. You mentioned there is a proposal in discussion related to pa patent and uh, public health. It has been going on for nearly four sessions, uh, if I understand, under the Standing Committee of the Law and the Patent without approval. Uh, although uh, we appreciate it is a member state driven process, but I do see there is a lacking of um, commitment or um, a correct direction from the secretarial level in terms of guiding this discussion going forward. Uh, a number of examples, for instance, the, the, the research or the studies prepared by the secretarial on the uh, patent exceptions and the limitations maintain the very neutral tone without really integrating the development agenda recommendations, say we need to mainstream some of the public health uh, perspective in the technical analysis. So I, I think in this regard, uh, I want to know what would be the uh, forward plan from the secretary level to move in this for agenda for, for uh, forward after four sessions of discussion. And secondly, uh, a few questions about the uh, patent information transparency, which has also been un uh, discussed and uh, in the context of public health. Um, for instance, um, the proposal that hasn't been pub uh, pu approved mentioned the recommendation of including um, INA um, uh, into the pharmaceutical patent uh, uh, disclosure, which uh, for, from public health perspective is very important to identify the variety of patent around the given medicine, which is often um, a strategy used by the industry to pro uh, prolong the monopoly in the market. So in this regard, there hasn't been really very much study or position given uh, from the VIPO side to, um, to guide this discussion forward. So I, I just want to know what's your opinion on this. And then uh, probably last question is about the um, uh, our colleague from KEI's question about technical assistance in consistent with the Doha Declaration. Um, so I wonder, although you, you have uh, explained the, the standards, procedure, and the practice of WIPO, but I'm wondering um, in cases, well, uh, the national patent law is under reform, but uh, p some, sometimes some uh, country was put under very heavy political pressure to adopt TRIPS plus provisions or other provisions that might be have the harmful uh, impact on the public health and other public interests in the country. And it's very rare to say um, WIPO has given any position or analysis in those circumstances. So I was wondering, is there any comments from your side, um, whether this is um, the mandate demand or whether WIPO is considering to engage more of this uh, political economy discussion um, in terms of country patent law reform? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Amit, uh, we'll take one and then I'll respond to a few. Uh, th um, th thank you, Director General, and thank you for the, the, the opportunity of, of having this discussion. Actually, my, my question related to the, the UN post-2015 development agenda. Um, I, know, I know the sector of external relations has been following this, um, the, and this closely and participating in the, in the New York uh, meetings. Uh, but uh, you know this question is, is very paramount in, in all the UN system now, and um, there's a lot of interest in it. So in addition to, to WIPO uh, following the UN process and being of the part of the UN task team, I think they, there could be appetite for a, a, a kind of a seminar or a discussion on that with different stakeholders, and 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 uh, and it could be very uh, timely. There's a lot of interest uh, uh, in that, and I'm encouraged by 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 seeing that tomorrow there's a there's a special book presentation on why global development. Uh, uh, succeeds that is hosted by, by the economics uh, division. So, so just, it was just a, a suggestion on, on, on this issue. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you very much for giving uh, us the opportunity here to speak. My name is Carola Streul. I'm representing Collecting Societies for Fine Arts and Photography, European Collecting Societies. And I have two uh, issues I would like to mention. One thing is you were talking about uh, the digital economy and the dialogue you want to in initiate. And I would be much appreciating to be, uh, if, if our constituency would be uh, included in this, uh, because we're extremely concerned about 
about the more and more industry-led solutions, which are putting the uh, authors' rights in their position more and more in the back stage. We, I just heard about the new draft of uh, the Spanish legislation, which includes a new remuneration right for um, um, kind of Google services where explicitly explicitly visual creators are excluded from remuneration in the legislation, which I think is discriminatory. Um, I, um, that's something um, of particular concern. The other issue I want to raise here is um, the resale right for uh, the artists. And uh, I'm particularly grateful for uh, the lunch event, which was organized with the help of Michelle and uh, Carol um, in December, and which attracted many interested parties uh, and many member countries uh, delegates being there. Um, the, uh, and uh, my question is about the follow-up and possible technical assistance. We have now also the interest coming from African countries and in particular Senegal is interested in taking a lead to demand uh, um, support uh, from, from WIPO uh, in, in this um, matter. First of all, we, it's, it's about making the, wor the right work in the countries uh, where it is in the legislation but not um, um, applied. Uh, in Africa, there is a growing interest because contemporary artworks are bought at cheap prices from the artists in Africa and sold at high prices in London, and nothing flows back to the countries. Um, that is uh, yeah, my question, what could be done? There are member countries also from developing countries interested to raise the question. Okay, well, let's have a shot at some of those, uh, and then we'll come back. Uh, so first, on guaranteeing uh, equal times, I'm afraid we can't give guarantees, but the intention is equal time for IFLA. The intention is equal time, and uh, it's not really within our capacity to uh, force member states to do anything, really. Um, I would say, look, the only other thing to consider is that we have to take issues one at a time. Uh, we don't have any... Uh, better way of doing things and the best way is to take things as they are as the most mature presents itself now i understand that libraries feel that you know there was a timetable set and this is very important on the other hand broadcasters have been talking since 1996 you know about uh, their rights so uh, it's not like it's a new issue that has suddenly crept in and pushed libraries out of the way. Uh, on the contrary. Uh, so I think, you know, the intention is there for equal time. But uh, with a little bit of patience, uh, I think the member states will progressively knock off one after the other. On remote participation for the Centre for Internet and Society from India, um, I think it's a, a, f a good uh, suggestion, if I may say. Um, we uh, have, as you know, fairly recently uh, only provided for remote viewing. Uh, and um, so remote participation will be a new phase. I think that will have to be discussed with the member states because it's a question of time management too. But um, a certainly a very valid point. On the series of questions from MSF, um, look, uh, I have, I would have the following uh, comments to make. I've got, we've got, uh, first of all, uh, in, as far as the SCP is concerned and its agenda, I think one of the big questions that's arising uh, amongst the membership for discussion at the moment is the number of meetings that we have as an organisation and how to manage that. So a lot of member states have expressed the view that we have too many meetings, first of all, and secondly, that our meetings are too inefficient. So in a, an era in which public resources are stretched uh, and in which you know, governments have to find budgets to send delegates to participate in meetings, we are hearing them saying increasingly, well, uh, we would like to see a better output to input ratio uh, and more efficiency. 
Now, one of the things that's arisen, I think, questions in relation to the public uh, health question in the normative committee of the, of the Standing Committee on Patents is to what extent is this a normative question and to what extent is this a, a pre-normative dialogue or discussion? Because if it's a pre-normative dialogue or discussion, then maybe you can hold a conference for it. And that would get a, a freer exchange of opinions because people would be less constrained that they're in a negotiating mode. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that, that uh, is animating people's mind in that particular area. The second thing I would say is please don't ask the Secretariat to do the work of the member states. We can't make people agree on anything. You know, Our job is to facilitate. Uh, and so we can't be taking a position. We must be taking a position uh, which is neutral and which facilitates a discussion between interested parties. We're not an interested party. You know, the interested parties are the ones that have to take their position. So uh, I understand that you have very strong views, understandably, because you represent, you're working on the front line uh, and very interested in saving lives. Uh, uh, and so I understand that. But uh, you are an interested party. We are not. And we can't be an interested party in this discussion. There's no more sensitive issue, in, uh, in my view, in the intellectual property world than health and uh, intellectual property. And I don't think that there is any one simple answer to it. I'm afraid it's a very, very complex question, as you know very complex question is going to remain a complex question and we're going to have to find the balance between encouraging investment in innovation because we do need that there is absolutely no doubt that we need to have investment in innovation on the one hand and on the other hand sharing the social benefit of the innovation you know there's no point in having innovation unless unless there is a social benefit to it so that's just not an easy question uh, and all we can do is facilitate a dialogue which we hope comes up with equilibrium positions here, 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 without anyone being absolutely right. And then on, on the question of pressure, well, I'd give a similar answer. I mean, we can't substitute ourselves for governments. Governments have to you know, stand on their own two feet and assess what their priorities are in the context of uh, their agendas. And what we have to do is to provide neutral, professional advice as to the full scope of possibilities that are available to the governments. Then uh, for Ahmed, I think, thank you very much for your suggestion, ICSTD. Um, and uh, uh, thank you very much for the suggestion on the post-2015 agenda. Yes. The only, only thing I would say is that one of the major challenges of that is going to be to have a manageable and comprehensible post-2015 agenda, and 60 priorities is not going to do it, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, that's our problem, I think, from our, our perspective. You know, we would love priority number one to be innovation, and number two, you know, cultural creativity, but that's just not going to happen. You know, there are more pressing priorities. So. Uh, and then on um, uh, fine arts and photography, um, yes, of course, we would. V the point of the dialogue would be to be inclusive and to hear all points of view uh, about this. And there are, you know, and precisely the sorts of of uh, difficulties to which you point, I think, are the reasons why we need the dialogue. Because a lot is happening in this space. And uh, a lot of the developments, uh, m which may be business or industry developments, have policy implications. And that's why I think we need to bring those out in, uh, in, a, in a dialogue. And on the resale right, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for this event, uh, which, as you say, was a very successful event. Um, and I think it's got uh, some promise because uh, going back to why Beijing and Marrakesh happened, you know, uh, one of the reasons I cited earlier was the alignment of interests in, in civil society, if you like. And I think another reason was the identification of an issue that was specific and that required a technical solution and that could assemble a political consensus. 
So I think everyone was happy to come around the specific issue of actors or audiovisual performances and say it is an injustice that they are not covered in the international copyright uh, framework. And everyone is able to come around VIPs and say it is an injustice, uh, the book famine, and we need to address it. And I think the resale right may be such an issue that you can get an international consensus around. Maybe, you know, uh, I wouldn't want to be <laughs> cited for being too radical about this, but, you know, it's just the sort of issue that you might be able to do something on because people can see the reason for it. You know, it's, it's apparent, it's, it's, it's transparent, uh, the need uh, for the artist, and, um, and it's not too much to bite off. It's something that's achievable with a specific and technical solution. So I would encourage you to continue. Uh, Cristina Manupinto, I'm representing the Ibero-American Alliance of Broadcasters for Intellectual Property, and you've mentioned the Broadcasting Treaty, and I think we agree with your view that uh, it is, there was a lot of work, uh, of progress done in the last meetings, but, and it is the most mature um, subject <coughs> in the SCCR agenda, um, but given there is also a lot of work to be done, um, especially on the uh, treat, treaty language, uh, for the next SCCR, how do you think? What is your uh, view that um, so that the the next at the next SCCR we can progress uh, uh, constructively, uh, especially given <coughs> the um, uh, lack of flexibility of some member states? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Another one, yes, please, the gentleman here. Thank you, Director General, for this uh, opportunity, and Massimo Vittori representing Origin is probably one of the few institutions on top of the oracle that would be in the position to explain the difference between GIs and Appalachian. <laughs> so that's why, uh, not surprisingly, a lot of interest for Lisbon. So we're very pleased with um, the advancement uh, with the works and uh, probably next year uh, the calling of a um, uh, diplomatic conference. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, on top of the um, uh, treaty making work, we should uh, we encourage WIPO to put a lot of emphasis on technical assistance for developing countries that uh, to be in a position to join. Um, this treaty should have um, the possibility to consolidate some of the existing uh, geographical indication of pollution of origin. And in this respect, also we would like to encourage WIPO to work on some new um, trends of international cooperation, namely um, the possibility, for instance, for uh, multinational corporations uh, in the um, agribusiness, uh, uh, in the agri-food business to, to work with developing countries to develop uh, alliances in order to help these countries to uh, to come up with geographical indication in the field of uh, coconut or coffee, for instance. There are a lot of examples that are very successful, and I think uh, we would be happy also to provide you some inputs in this respect. We have some of our members that have signed this kind of agreements and are very successful, and somehow they um, uh, modify one of the um, generalized concepts that multinational and developing countries all the time uh, have clashes. Um, second issue is the um, generic top-level domains. And um, uh, we, we are aware that uh, uh, the train might have left the station probably in some respects. We are aware of also some problems with uh, ICANN governance, although some progress also uh, are being made in, in these days. Uh, we, we would like um, WIPO to work uh, and to provide some intellectual inputs uh, um, uh, vis -a -vis, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the risks that uh, generic string like uh, the dot wine, dot organic, dot food uh, might pose in terms of, um, generally speaking, to confer somehow monopoly rights to private companies that would, will manage in the future those uh, strings. Some of them have been already delegated, for instance, I'm thinking dot coffee, again, to, to link it up with developing countries. And also, um, uh, the more classical problem of um, the possibility for geographical indications to be part of the uniform dispute resolution uh, uh, mechanism uh, uh, policy. Uh, because now they are excluded, and also some um, uh, to work and to clarify some legal uncertain, uh, uncertainty with respect to the trademark clearinghouse. We have heard that geographical indication might qualify to be uh, included in the trademark clearinghouse, but it's not clear if this is true, and would like uh, uh, some work to be done in this respect. Probably, as you mentioned, in the digital economy and IPR, 
agenda, for instance, it's something that could fit. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. The gentleman down the end, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, my name's Dr. Balasegram. I um, work with uh, Medicine Sans Frontier as well. And in fact, I just want to make up uh, um, a couple of comments. First of all, I'd like to thank you for convening this meeting and giving us the opportunity to meet and, and talk to you. Um, secondly, I would, I'd, I'd just like to give you a perspective, not talking as someone coming from my organization, but someone with um, 20 years experience as a medical doctor and a public health physician, um, very much working in the, in, in the international perspective. Um, I, I, I do understand uh, very much the point that you made about collaboration and competition, and I do agree with you that this is going to be one of the big challenges. And coming from the public health field, in fact, we do see a very big tension um, between c the collaboration aspect and the competition aspect, and it's very much reflected in this whole innovation versus access debate, which I think is often presented in very much a kind of false dichotomy. But ultimately, what I would say to you is that as a public health physician, I have, uh, I really do struggle to, to understand what the current framework of the intellectual property system offers to the public health community. Why do I say that? Well, if, if you look at some of the, the issues around the public health guarantees and safeguards that were discussed more than 10 years ago and debated and even enshrined in declarations, we see a very strong pushback coming back. Um, through a lot of uh, trade agreements that are really promoting measures that, that are called TRIPS Plus, but we don't really perceive as being in the public health interest. Uh, and I think that, I, I think this is a very fundamental point because it's an, it raises on another issue you talked about, which is about budgets and affordability. And one of the big struggles we have in the field of public health is the fact that we are, we are facing an, an era of moving into a very cash-trapped, um, perspective of governments, uh, you know, having uh, struggling to meet their own budgets, but even international organisations like us are struggling to rationalise um, medical care. Um, I don't think that it's. I feel I'm a radical to talk about public health as a as a as an interest. It's not an interest of an individual group. It's an everybody's. It's an, it's a societal need and a societal benefit. And I I would strongly encourage WIPO to start thinking in terms of public health as as something as a societal benefit and something that belongs to society and not an individual uh, or, or group uh, kind of uh, activist push. Um, and therefore, I really, uh, really ask, you know, what can WIPO do in this area? I think it's important for WIPO to reflect a little bit on the impact of some of these new measures on public health. And I think maybe to understand a bit better uh, possibly the negative impacts and provide advice to countries and governments um, because you, you mentioned about you know, policy choices being uh, in the realm of individual governments. Well, that's th true in theory, but in practice, we know that it's a much more complicated picture. And on top of that, when you talk about public health, you often have to be more transnational in your approach um, because international public health interventions go beyond individual countries' needs, desires, and uh, I would say interests. Um, and therefore, I think you know, the policy guidance uh, and, uh, that WIPO can offer uh, on I think the challenges that some of these shifts in intellectual property can have on public health is, is quite important. I'd like to finish by the comment uh, going back again about this tension between innovation and access. I, I work in several disease fields. I'm not a specialist in one area. But in many of these fields, we've really see, uh, seen a real lack of innovation. And in the last 10 years, we have overtly dependent on public funding and philanthropic funding. So it's very difficult to understand how this system is really working for us. And likewise, I've also spent 10 years working in R&D and drug development. And I know full well that, in fact, your point about collaboration is very important. Uh, if we are looking at true needs-driven R&D, we need much more collaboration in the field. And in fact, fragmentation of the R&D has been a major problem and why, in fact, I think we haven't delivered in a timely fashion. So I, I would just like to end there because I don't, I, I, I'm not a technical or legal person, um, but I wanted to just mainly give a public health perspective. Uh, well, thank you very much. Let me, uh, may I uh, perhaps knock off a few and then we'll come back to, or try to uh, deal with a few. Uh, so, um, Look, for the uh, Ibero-American Broadcasting Alliance, first of all, you know, welcome, and uh, this is a great development that, that you exist and that you'll, we will have an, uh, another, I think, occasion at the next Standing Committee on Copyright to, 
to uh, hear from you um, in a side event. Um, we can't cure, unfortunately, you know, the lack of flexibility that might be demonstrated by certain uh, member states, unfortunately. Uh, and it's a very painful process, of course, and uh, uh, this long process of trying to get people on the same page. So I don't have a, a, a uh, ready answer uh, for you on that. But, um, you know, I would remain cautiously underlined optimistic, cautiously. Uh, I understand there are some who are locked in mental frameworks that belong to a different technological reality. Uh, and that is not helping us go forward. Uh, uh, so we will we'll, we'll see. I think we'll have a better idea after the next uh, standing committee. For Origin, uh, there were a great deal of questions. Uh, we see that rising interest in developing qu countries, and we are doing more and more that related to geographical indications because, of course, agriculture is fundamental to uh, uh, most economies in uh, most developing economies, and we see this is a good way of <clears throat> of being able to advance the specificities of that each of those countries have to to offer. Um, you know, uh, on as you, as you put it, for the multinationals in the agri agri food business, we'll of course have to get a clearance from our new conflict regime. Uh, when we approach this. But generally speaking, I think public-private partnerships have a lot to offer, and a lot to offer, uh, uh, and a lot to offer in terms of practical assistance in how to get uh, off the ground. On the GTLDs, well, um, there are a lot of questions here, um, and, uh, you know, it's not an easy environment in which to operate. Uh, we don't take the policy decisions. WIPO doesn't take the policy decisions. Those decisions are taken by ICANN. Now, as you mentioned, we've seen some uh, movement in that space recently, which may suggest uh, an evolution in the way in which ICANN operates in the future. Uh, and so that may provide more opportunities to be able to uh, deal with some of the intellectual property questions, or it may provide less opportunity. We're not quite sure, actually, yet, which way that, that will evolve. Um, and on the intellectual input that you would like to see us contribute, well, it reminded me when you said that, that when we did our uh, first internet domain name process back in the late 90s on this, we, ha we opened up our recommendations for public comment, and one of the comments was, you know, that the recommendations were a disgrace and please take the word intellectual out of your title. <laughs> so, uh, but we will try to make some intellectual input, in, uh, have some intellectual, we try to work with ICANN all the time to sensitize them to that, but intellectual property is not necessarily their highest priority. Uh, they, they're going elsewhere. Uh, but thank you for your comments in this regard. And then to Dr. Balisubramaniam, I think, uh, was it? It was, if I get your name correctly. Uh, uh, well, thank you for all of those comments, and I appreciate it. But look, one of the things that I would uh, point out to you, if I may, is that we don't have a binary uh, environment for intellectual property anymore at all. You know, if you went back 20 years or 30 years, you did have a binary environment. You had the national and you had the multilateral. But now we have this extremely complex environment, uh, policy environment, in which you have national agendas, bilateral agendas, plurilateral agendas, you know, and then regional agendas, and then multilateral agendas. And that's a very complex environment, which I think is new to all of us. We're all trying to understand what it means uh, and why it's happening. Uh, and so we're stuck a little uh, in this. So I think, if I may say, if you'll permit me, you are tending to conflate intellectual property across all of those different environments, the developments in all of them, with the multilateral. I mean, we're one part of it. Uh, and our influence is, is, is limited to that one part. Uh, so we have no influence over uh, bilateral negotiations. We have no influence over plurilateral negotiations. 
that's the reality. That's why they make them bilateral and plurilateral. You know, that's the whole point. Uh, so uh, that's a very complex environment that I think we see now, which is a relatively new phenomenon, I would say. Uh, and um, and we have to negotiate and uh, uh, navigate that environment in a way which maintains the relevance of the multilateral. Naturally, we sitting here believe in the multilateral. We believe that the multilateral gives states the greatest amount of protection. Uh, it, uh, it reduces vulnerabilities of states to operate in a multilateral environment. Uh, but the reality of the world today is that it's a multi-speed world, just looking at it. That's the reality. Uh, and I think that we need to be looking, you know, thinking about that architecture uh, and what it means for policy development, uh, because that's, that's how it's happening. Uh, but uh, well, many of your other comments, you know, I totally understand and, you know, sympathise with. So the lady here, please. Um, I'm Philae representative. Uh, Philae is a Latin American organization that represents performance rights. And thank you, Mr. Director General, for bringing, giving us the opportunity of this meeting. Um, uh, there are two points where I would like to raise the attention. One is um, that in spite of the WPPT treaty, which uh, regulated the, uh, the rights in the internet, we are um, seeing now and we are worried because performance rights are weakening in the internet scope in spite of this regulation. Um, and this is why, because uh, other right holders, which are in a better bargaining position than performers, are um, uh, weakening this, this position of them and these rights. Um, in our view, we should find a way where performers could be uh, fairly remunerated in the internet scope. Um, and in our view, this could be uh, following a system um, similar to the directive uh, for, for um, rental rights and um, uh, rental and lending rights in Europe, which uh, states uh, a remuneration right for performers similar to the um, to the rental right um, included in it. So um, it could be a way to strengthen the performers' right and to avoid this uh, weakening of, of them. That um, because even the directive, the European directive, is in the in the end stronger than the WPPT treaty, and FILAI performers are uh, in a wider um, scope than the European scope. This is why we would, we would like to 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 have uh, some action from WIPO or to see how it could be. Uh, improved to 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 get this right uh, in the internet scope for performers, and the second question relates to the broadcasters treaty. Um, as you said, the broadcasters treaty is going to be um, to be to focus only uh, in a very restricted and limited area. Uh, in our view, if uh, the broadcasters treaty is for the protection of the signal. Um, it could be a good way to, to regulate um, the, the scope and the rights of, of the broadcasters. But in any case, um, we see that broadcasters are going to be granted uh, some rights, and we would like that performers are balanced, have uh, their rights in a balanced way um, referred to broadcasters. We mean that uh, there should be a possibility of authorizing, uh, of asking the authorization of, uh, of the rights to performers and to other right holders, such as producers in this case, um, or at least a remuneration right for them. Because on the contrary, uh, a, a broadcasting treaty that is uh, it's aimed to protect um, the broadcasters could weaken also the performers' rights. So um, it would be um, better to balance this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Francois? So I'm uh, Francois Curchot, representing CP, the Center for International Intellectual Property Studies. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to meet with us on a yearly basis. This is much appreciated by everybody, I think. Um, last year, you, you said that uh, uh, one of the big focuses for WIPO in the coming two years would be improving the Madrid system. 
and uh, work to improve the Madrid system has started in, in a very satisfactorily manner. And I would like simply to encourage you and your staff to go on in that direction. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ahmed. Sorry, I apologize for, for, for taking the floor again. It was, it was not my intention, but I was prompted by one of the interventions. Um, you know, the Marrakesh Treaty was, was a historic treaty on many counts, and one of them, actually, that is not often uh, noticed is, is, to my knowledge, is the first international intellectual property instrument that contains in its preamble a reference to human rights and human rights instruments. And that uh, brings the whole debate about the issue of intellectual property and human rights. And that is, is debated in many fora. Most recently, the, the Council of Human Rights in Geneva, a, a statement was made by almost 90 countries uh, urging international IP organizations to adopt the human rights approach in their work. Uh, I'm just pointing to that in the sense that this is, I think, an emerging issue. Uh, many countries, including Egypt, I just wrote about it, have adopted human rights, um, IP in their constitution under human rights. Uh, and, and, and if you call it as areas of political risk, I see that people, many people are, are, are grappling with, with this equation also. Uh, and um, I know it's fraught with a lot of difficulties in, for, 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 for WIPO, uh, but I, I mean, I have been interested in this, and when I Google this on uh, WIPO and human rights, what appears is a 1998 report of a very interesting seminar that was held between the Office of the High Commissioner uh, and WIPO on this issue for the 50th, 50th anniversary of, of the human, um, Universal Human Rights Declaration. But I think it's an area that, that again, there's a lot of appetite for it, and, and again, I know that, that you see long, far in the horizons uh, uh, before things uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, become a challenging thing. Thank you, Jens. And Thank you, Mr. Director General. I'm Pierre Scherf from Health and Environment Program. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the occasion to meet you and to get a better insight of what happens at WIPO and what will happen in the near future. You mentioned the, the ICC uh, procedure as a political problem, and uh, you are surely right, because not long ago than uh, yesterday evening, uh, Sweden expressed uh, his will to withdraw from the, this processus, and uh, the Ambassador McCook, uh, Ben McCook was obliged to interrupt the session and to find a way to uh, get Sweden back to the, to the negotiation. So could you... Uh, just give uh, some ideas uh, in which way you uh, you would try to push uh, the, the IGC forward to uh, in order to get to uh, to an end uh, before uh, everybody will uh, be too tired or maybe even dead. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jens. Um, I'm Jens Bammel from the International Publishers Association, and I would like to um, first make a comment on the far too long and lengthy and extensive number of meetings we're having at WIPO, and then I'd like to suggest another one, another meeting. <laughs> um, so first, just a rant. I think this year has been a record in how the number of days that are actually committees meeting. I think it, uh, it's over 130 days, I think, at least the ones that I should be attending or should be following, and I find that uh, an incredible uh, burden, and I'm delighted to hear that the member states also consider that a burden. With all that, and with your tool of budgetary constraints, which you always have, I think you should uh, take this as a as a wonderful lob to you, which you can now uh, smash into the court by um, seriously discussing ways of making this procedure more effective. And um, anybody who's attended any of these one-week, two-week meetings n has a sense for the time that is actually usefully spent and the time that isn't usefully spent and the way, um, you know, other organizations with equally complex problems are able to have uh, meetings which don't take longer than two days. So I would strongly encourage you to uh, take this opportunity when they say, you know, we have to improve this. Please uh, do that. Um, that also um, uh, is connected with the question of communications. Um, we can, of course, all 
um, look at the website, which is much improved. And by the way, congratulations to that. Uh, and see all the wonderful documents. But when we read the wonderful documents, um, you don't actually know what's going on in what meeting, or where the state is, or what's actually happening, or whether we are, you know, um, two weeks from a So they're well written. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They may be well written, but um, w it is um, a great uh, compliment that this room is so full, and it's a great sadness that it is only so full here, because there's so many NGOs here and uh, that are accredited as observers, uh, and it is so difficult for them to choose the meetings that they should go to and can attend and think about what is worth their while. And that's why I'd like to suggest I found your presentation extremely concise and useful and told me a lot of what's going on even in the committees that I'm not in. I'd love to see an NGO open day at WIPO where actually it's not just you but the other uh, assistant and di deputy directors or their, uh, the staff responsible for committees gives an honest or at least a concise um, summary of what's going on and uh, th therefore gives us all the opportunity to occasionally once a year come, all come and take stock of what's happening. And my final point on that uh, is now that we have an NGO liaison officer, uh, it would be great if that institution would have the license to be a little bit more journalistic about what's going on and what's happening so that we all have an even better sense of what's going on than through the already incredibly voluminous and, and now more comprehensive and more beautiful website. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll take those if I may. Um, so, for Philae, um, noted, I'd say, you know, noted uh, your comment about uh, performance rights and difficulties on the internet, and I think this is, joins the comments that I made a little earlier about the dialogue that we need to explore what the impact of the changing technologies and business environment are on, you know, uh, our cultural creators. Uh, and so, uh, noted. And broadcasting, again, I can only say noted, you know, what your, your view of the scope that the broadcasting treaty should have. Uh, and obviously there are some member states that are inclined to your view absolutely about this, but I'm not sure with that we're going to come out with such a, uh, such a, a um, big scope for the treaty. Uh, let's see from the next meeting how we go. Uh, to Francois Curcio, thank you very much for the um, Madrid system comment and this will continue to be a major priority and I think our strategic plan is looking like being a three-year plan actually for, uh, so I hope that you will progressively see improvements in the quality of the service over that time. And Ahmed, uh, yes, very much noted the uh, intellectual property and human rights. I did have occasion to address the question. Uh, I think last year on Nelson Mandela Day um, in the Human Rights Council. Uh, and I do see the growing interest in this perspective and looking at things from this uh, point of view. Uh, on the IGC, what's the way forward? Well, uh, for uh, health and environment, look, I think um, that basically we are getting to the stage where we have exhausted the technical discussions. And what we need is a, a political discussion. Uh, I think we now need to get political engagement uh, because that's the only way in which we will be able to get over the uh, technical discussions and move the, this forward. So it's very complex. I'm not sure what the uh, right answer is. Um, and to Jens uh, from the IPA on uh, the number of meetings, thank you for this. I think yeah, this is obviously a growing consensus now that there are too many meetings. A lot of people focus on uh, time and meeting management as, as part of the solution. I must say that that, of course, you know, we can make uh, improvements there, but I don't think that's the real problem. I think uh, that perhaps we have got ourselves into a situation with standing committees in which uh, we feel that because they're standing, they have to meet. Uh, and uh, we should remember, in my view, that they are normative committees. And I think if they don't have a normative agenda, there's no point in them meeting. Because we can have a much richer conference. You don't need accredited governmental delegates for a conference, for a discussion. 
a conference or a discussion can be much more open if they're not in negotiating mode. So uh, I think, if I may say, if I may put my neck out and say, one of the problems with the Standing Committee on Patents is it doesn't have a normative agenda. You know, uh, the discussion on health and, and public health and intellectual property is a pre-normative discussion. It's an exploratory discussion in which uh, uh, we're looking for information, we're looking for positions and so on. So, and that, a, a better environment for that might be a conference and a more efficient way of communicating information and, and positions. So I think part of the answer is uh, moving the programming responsibility up to a higher level so that committees get instructions. Please do this, you know, because at a higher level they have taken decisions about what the agendas are rather than having a committee which in the worst manifestation meets and you know, uh, it concludes its meeting at 1 a.m. on Saturday morning without having agreed its agenda. You know, so if it doesn't have an agenda, why should it meet? Uh, and on communications, well, I can only sympathize uh, with what you say and say that it's a, I think it's a massive problem, you know, uh, a massive problem because we're fa for all international organizations and some are better than others, but we're facing a situation in which I don't think anyone under 30 reads any document in the UN system. Producing, well, why would they? You know, it's just not the, what they're used to. It's, they don't, that's not how they receive information. Uh, so we really, and soon that'll be under 40 and under 50 and under 60, and then no one will be reading anything. So uh, we need to, I think, uh, really, you know, it's a big problem because uh, if you want to us to, to engage, which we are doing with social media and other forms of more succinct and, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, I'm trying to find a, a euphemism for honest, uh, which was the word that you used, uh, but a, a more uh, direct way of communicating information, then we are going to have to think about the role of an international civil service and what we can do uh, and what we can say. Um, now, I'm sure we can improve. You know, It's not as dramatic as that, that we're completely locked into a 50-page you know, evasive document. Uh, we're not. Uh, we can find ways of communicating information more directly and, and better, uh, but we always have to be a bit careful that we uh, respect the fact that we are a secretariat and not the member states. It's a, it's a big problem. Okay, any other um, questions? Or we're nearly there, I think. Dominique, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Francis. Actually, this is not a, a question, but really, uh, since I guess we're getting to the end of of this meeting, um, I really wanted on behalf of, of my organization, and, and I guess hopefully uh, many of those that are around this stable express, a uh, token of appreciation for all the uh, terrible amount of work that you've done for, uh, for all of us uh, during your mandate, and the, the tasks that you, uh, you've accomplished so well um, during that time. Um, you have been able to achieve very, very substantial outcomes. Uh, in a very difficult uh, political, economic uh, situation around the world, um, and really to move WIPO up to uh, higher grounds and a different level with uh, a lot of vision, uh, much transparency, at least as much as um, was possible, and certainly uh, a very uh, inspired uh, uh, and inspirational leadership, uh, together with your uh, secretariat, of course, and um, just to say how much we look forward to uh, continuing this good work with you during your next uh, mandate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dominique, for your kind words. Uh, and thanks to everyone for coming. And certainly we'll take on board all of your suggestions in one way or another, and uh, including suggestions about remote participation, about our meetings, and about our communications. Uh, and thanks once again.